namaste. My name is Preeti Upala, and I am a global thought leader and a multimedia personality. Welcome to my podcast, The Preeti Experience. Join me as I explore some of the most fascinating and crucial issues that affect our world today. I take a unique global perspective on these issues and the very foundation of my insights is humanity and spirituality. I'm Preeti Upala and welcome, welcome to the Preeti, Preeti experience. experience. Namaste everyone. Satri Akal. Namaskarandi. I'm so honored to be here uh, at the Think India event um, and uh, I thank uh, Shivam for inviting me and organizing this. This is my first um, address to this amazing group. I'm just learning about it so I'm just so honored and thrilled to be talking about something that I'm passionate about. and. Um, uh, to 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 a group like yourself, I know you're so passionate about the future of this country. So, um, all right, uh, today is a historic day. Um, it, 19 years ago, pretty much on this very day, the 11th of May, um, India conducted its three nuclear tests in Pokhran, and that was historic for the country. And um, it put India in a very, very special group of countries, right, uh, with nuclear capabilities. It was a big deal. And so I think it's just ominous and perfect that we are, uh, we are talking about all of these things on this day almost 20 years later. So I will start with a very brief introduction. I don't want to take too much of your time about myself because maybe you've never heard of me. And... Um, I just, uh, I'll give you a, a brief intro so you understand. Uh, my name is Preeti Upala, uh, born in Dubai and lived in uh, Europe before my family moved to um, Australia. I was an investment banker there. I worked uh, in the corporate world, but it wasn't my passion, my dharma. So I had a career change and I realized that I'm creative and artistic and belong on the global stage and I just looked at the things that I loved doing and I knew that the corporate world was not for me so I made a change I quit cold turkey and I got into the film industry in Australia for one year I worked there in TV film I won a bunch of beauty pageants and all that good stuff I became famous there and then I won a scholarship to study in New York and uh, I just bought a one-way ticket and came with a suitcase and uh, nothing but a little suitcase and a lot of dreams. Uh, I just had the conviction that it would, it would all work out for me. Uh, that was several years ago. So now I do many things. I, um, I, I work in Hollywood as an actor and a producer of TV, um, commercials and all that good stuff. I um, also have my own radio show called The Eternal Hour. And I have my own YouTube channel called The Preeti Experience. So please check it out because I'm trying to really grow my base and uh, get more you know, people in, involved and excited about things that I talk about. Uh, I am a geopolitical uh, analyst here, a, a journalist. I write for about 20 different outlets on topics like geopolitics, international relations, counterterrorism. Middle East politics, um, U.S.-India relations, peace, religion, and spirituality. I speak around the world also on both politics, dharma, and spirituality as well. Uh, and um, it's a joy. I've been privileged to speak at some incredible events like the WEF and Horace's uh, in New York, uh, the Wellness 360 Dubai, um, University of Zurich, and, and so on, and hope to do a lot more of that in the future. Uh, I'm writing my first book. It's actually on Shakti, and I think this group is 
the right group for my book. So please keep me um, keep in touch with me because when the book comes out, I will uh, let you know. I think you will love it because it's a critique on um, Western idea of feminism and a look at Shakti, which is an Indic version of feminism, which actually works. Um, and uh, I'm a Dharma ambassador. I uh, have traveled around the world and uh, been to almost 100 countries, so I've got an interesting worldview, and I take everything in a very holistic manner. So that's me in a nutshell. I've done all these interesting things. Uh, but this is my passion, you know, to inspire and empower people through my work and my presence, Sped, uh, talk about uh, our civilizational wisdom. I feel like I'm an embodiment of that in some way in the world, and I just aspire to share and be that for everyone. Okay, great. So I let's get started. Today's topic is the U.S.-India relations. Um, let's go back to the very beginning to analyze this relationship. We must go to 1941, which is pre-independence, uh, and we need to look at the um, uh, the Atlantic Charter uh, of 1941 which is when uh, Franklin D. Roosevelt, who, is, who was the American president at the time, signed this uh, charter with the UK, uh, essentially uh, ensuring that all the Commonwealth colonies, I guess, had the right to self-determination and freedom. So as a result, India, of course, being the crown jewel of the British Empire, uh, was able to uh, get that as well for itself. So uh, that's where it all started, and a lot of people don't know that. So in some way, the U.S. kind of played a pivotal role back then. But since then, I think the relationship has been antagonistic at best. Um, and um, uh, so hopefully it gets better, because as we will see, they should be the best of friends, but they're not. So what's going on? Uh, when you look at... Uh, relationship between two countries, you have to look at uh, what are you giving to the other and what are you receiving. So then at the end you can assess for yourself uh, whether this is a fair relationship that where you're actually respected. Uh, so let's take a look. Three factors for a strategic alliance between two nations are trade, politics, and military. So the first one is trade. So the trade uh, balance today is actually over $150 billion U.S. between India and America, and you'll be happy to know that it's actually in India's favor. So we actually export more to them than we import. Um, the, India is the only country in the world that has a big deficit with the U.S. in terms of technology services. So that's fantastic. Uh, this number is great, but it's nowhere near what it could be. It should be a lot more. Um, I just want to read out some numbers that um, Dr. Jay Shankar uh, had um, uh, used uh, at a uh, think tank event that he did recently, which I thought was quite impressive. He said, uh, this was at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. He said trade has quadrupled to 150 billion over the last seven to ten years. Uh, U.S. investments in India has crossed the 50 billion dollar mark, and the India's investment in the U.S. has also hit the 50 billion dollar mark. India has cleared 286 projects worth 97 billion in the recent years. Indian companies have invested 25 billion in the US, 350 million of which are in research and development, and the recent Indian aircraft defense contracts have created 40,000 jobs in the US. A f uh, it's great, but it could be a lot more even than that. A fair dialogue should take place, uh, considering India's priorities and concerns as well. A lot has been said, of course, about the, the climate of doing business in India, but demonizing this climate of doing business in India by U.S. companies could end up being counterproductive. Um, 
so uh, that's that's for the trade bit so I think on trade we're doing well then the second one is political we're both democracies both secular liberal uh, free market access uh, capitalistic as much as we can say that uh, so uh, I would say even in the political arena we uh, there is obviously an alignment there uh, then the third one is military so the US army has started doing a lot of exercises with the Indian army in fact the US Navy exercises more with the Indian Navy than anybody else in the world and the recent Malabar exercises are uh, proof uh, to that uh, we have recently started buying uh, the advanced American military equipment so traditionally we have always gotten our uh, weapons arms and military equipment from the Soviet Union originally and then Russia and some few other nations as well Russia really supplied a lot of that including the MiG-21s and their missile system which is very good uh, I think obviously France also has sold and given or lent us several of their jets and so on uh, the but the American uh, you know the purchasing of American uh, military equipment is a new one you know and I think the US wants us to buy a lot more from them uh, obviously I'm sure you would have all uh, watched the uh, the Namaste Trump event in um, the Motera Stadium in in Ahmedabad recently there was a huge event that whole event the grand event ended with a uh, India US deal uh, of um, three billion and it's essentially a purchase of the MH60 uh, and Apache helicopters uh, and and all some I mean that's advanced military equipment there for you uh, but I think uh, so when you look at these three things I think trade is good of course political systems are aligned I think military we could do more at the end of the day you have to ask yourself if there is an attack uh, will the US bail you out I would qu question that I'm not so sure that it, it would for many reasons I mean obviously the distance is one thing but you know it hasn't in the past you know when we look at this relationship I think you need to be pragmatic you have to understand that since 1947 till today other than I think the 1960 the 65 no the 62 with the with China that was the only time when it offered any help whatsoever I think other than that it has been uh, sort of um, incognito let's say and um, especially 1971 I think it really was thwarted some of our efforts in that whole liberation of Bangladesh war that we had I think it's important to remember that the US has re recogn recognized Pakistan uh, first in 1947 before it ever recognized India as an independent nation and for some reason it has sort of been um, in, in bed with Pakistan for all of these decades so consecutive um, US administrations have had the same sort of foreign policy and we'll talk about that a, a bit later but uh, just to give you an idea that I think on the military front I think we are it's not optimal and we could do a, a lot more so when I want to look at these two nations I will look at the good the bad and the way forward so what's working what's not working and where to from here so the good bits right okay political system both democracies secular liberal free market access capitalism market driven economy at, for India since 1991 which is great the USP for the United States of America is obviously technological advancement um, that's really what you know that what makes it great I think in the world and then you look at India 
its greatest um, uh, export really is also technological uh, services and development, right? Uh, it has been for decades. So, uh, and you look at Silicon Valley, it's full of Indian startups, uh, CEOs, developers, programmers, from the very bottom sort of low level basic jobs to the highest of the high. You know, I, I would say the top 10 uh, tech, tech companies in the world today have Indians as CEOs. So we have a lot to be proud about. This can always be more, of course, but I think we're doing extremely well um, in this uh, region. Uh, English language, you know, India is the second largest English speaking uh, population in the world. The, um, India is also the youngest labor force in the world. Something like what, 80% of the population is under the age of 30. I think the median age is 27 or 25, which is great. So this is a mobile, dynamic, tech savvy, um, English speaking a talent pool, which is extremely attractive to the EU, the US, the Western world, um, Europe, you know, honestly, to the to the whole world at large. And when you look at our competitors, that's a place where they cannot compete with us on. We are uh, at the top on this. And this is something we really need to capitalize on more. Uh, shared values, you know, I think family values, tradition, work hard, ethics, morals, all of these things are identical, you know, especially you think about Hindus, Buddhists and Jains um, and Sikhs, you know, when they go to the US or the UK, they have absolutely no problem with assimilation because it's similar values that we genuinely hold. Uh, shared threats, you know, I've always said this, the two greatest threats uh, in the world are Number one is a rising imperialist, chi uh, imperialistic China. And number two is religious fundamental terrorism. Uh, it affects the U.S. as much as it does India. In fact, I would say the U.S. and, and India are the, in the firing line of these two th great threats. So you have that in common. Uh, so there's obviously a lot to be happy about, but then let's look at what's not working. All right, the bad bits. Uh, because when I look at these two countries on paper, I mean, they should be the best of allies, you know, for the last 70 years. Why haven't they had a, a better relationship? But yeah, they don't. They haven't. Right. So let's let's see why. So some of the thorns in this relationship are obviously um, strategic alliances is one. International diplomacy is a delicate balancing act. It's not easy for any country. So the greatest thorn in this relationship has obviously been uh, the alliances that these two countries choose to have. For India, it has had independent relationships with Russia with Iran and even China, all of which are very adversarial to the US. The Russian relation is a particularly interesting one. When you look at since independence, uh, even pre-independence, I would say the one country that has come to our rescue during all those wars that has supplied us with weapons, sold us weapons when nobody else would, uh, is Russia, right? And uh, you that's something that you don't take lightly, and you shouldn't, I think, just out of integrity for the relationship. And even to this day, it's very strong. I mean, I was at this Ricina Dialogues earlier uh, this year, and they had the whole um, Indo-Pacific rim, and they were talking about that, and, and I think the, the Russian contingent was very excited about this, right? And they... Russia, just like the rest of the world, wants a strong India, and they would much prefer dealing with India than it, they would with, with China, for example. So this is a relationship that we take very seriously, and we have every right to. And I, because of uh, the U.S.'s adversarial 
bent towards Russia, uh, that's a big thorn, you know, because there's a lack of trust there. When you look at we are, are all of our missile systems, our fighter jets and so on, a lot of them are Russian. And uh, now we're starting to buy the U.S. Um, military equipment. We have to make sure that they can communicate with each other. And I think there is a pull from the U.S. to get us, to wean us off from, from Russia in terms of buying these these great weapons uh, and start buying the U.S. ones more so. But, uh, I mean, that's a decision that's, that's our prerogative. We have to make the decision. Uh, the other relationship, of course, is Iran. I think Iran one is a little bit more um, up and down. You know, I think it's not as solid as the Russian one because, I mean, I, I know people love to say, oh, we've had such a great civilizational connection and this people to people connection. But I mean, we've also had issues with them, too. They have also we've also had some bloodshed, some massacres, some invasions and so on that came from them, too. Uh, you know, I mean, you never forget it's an Islamic Republic of Iran. Right. Um, you know, yes, it's not. The, the source of our problems, but um, you really look at, uh, again, in a conflict situation, I'm, I'm not so sure what they could, they could uh, offer us. Uh, we did buy 80% of our oil from them, right? But now that has changed dramatically because now we're getting it from other parts of the Gulf and also the U.S. So this has really changed the game because I think that energy trade was huge and you think about uh you know moving forward you know one has to think about these things i do think it's an important relationship i don't think we walk away from this because uh we have our the ports we have the the chabahar port which is really the only gateway to afghanistan and i have a feeling that this afghanistan issue is going to be very hot for the next several years. I don't think it's going anywhere anytime soon. It's going to be like a boiling point of war and conflict and all kinds of bad things. So, I mean, if India wants to step up, you know, we, other than that port, we don't have this sort of access to Afghanistan. So Iran was, will have to be our ally and our passage, I suppose, to Afghanistan. So I would say it's a relationship that is important to us uh so but the big elephant in the room of course is pakistan you know our friendly neighbor right so this is where i think this us india relationship gets a little perverted because unfortunately they have been in bed with the enemy for all of these years they have propped up military dictatorships they have been giving billions in aid right development aid that eventually obviously always goes towards terrorism and their nuke program. Consecutive U.S. administrations have been very antagonistic uh, of their U.S. foreign policy vis-a-vis -vis India. They have uh, somehow always uh, sided with Pakistan. For some reason, Pakistan has sold them this great dream that it's a great ally, that it's going to help them somehow when... Um, you know, to fight the war in terrorism. And the U.S. completely bought that. You know, it uh, it's very naive. Sometimes I think, are they that naive or or are they that strategic? Either they don't know, either they're clueless or they know everything and they're still playing their chess moves, thinking that they're going to outsmart Pakistan um, in some way down the further down the track. I have a suspicion it's actually the first not the second, which is very disturbing for us because I think we have known for so long exactly the game of Pakistan, right? The great game. But, um, uh, oh, well, I think... So September 11, 2001, America learned about the global jihad movement and it learned about Islamic terror. India has known it for a thousand years, to be honest. You know, we are the greatest victims of this jihad movement in some way uh, we are also the greatest victors because even after a thousand years of invasion and colonization and cultural genocide and forced conversions 
they only managed to convert what 15% of the country, right? Um, that's pretty spectacular, I think. That's uh, the testament to our re resilience and something that I think uh, we really need to, you know, be aware of. So um, I think, you, you know, we just don't know why they have been sort of lopsided and antagonistic. Um, I would say that the best U.S. president for India has obviously been George W. Bush Jr., uh, hands down. I, I think people might find that surprising, but really he was for so many reasons. Uh, and uh, Trump, it's yet to be seen. I think the rhetoric is there. He's saying all the right things. He's making all the right noises, but uh, I think policy and actions will speak louder than uh, words with him. So let's see how things pan out. Certainly he was better than the previous uh, administration. I have no doubt about that. I would say the worst is a tie. It's either Bill Clinton or Nixon. I think they both were very anti-India, very pro-Pakistan, very antagonistic. Nixon especially uh, with that 97 war that we have. And I think Bill Clinton just uh, didn't get his terror, I mean, the whole Pakistan Middle East policy right. So, um, you know, Christine Fair, who the famous political scientist, she always says, um, the U.S. thinks that Pakistan is India's problem. But that's not true at all. It's not India's problem. It's the whole world's problem. And people need to really wake up and step up and smell the coffee, right, before it's too late. Um, I think there is a lack of understanding of this ideology, of the history of how this ideology was spread and came to be and the fundamental uh, principles that govern it and sort of this, uh, this caliphate movement, which is very real, the war on terrorism, uh, I mean, the, the, uh, the, the jihad movement, let's say, is a very real thing. I think people uh, in the West are very, very naive because they think, they blame the neo neocons, uh, right? They think, oh, it's what has this Western imperialist done to the Middle East? That's why the, all, the Middle East is in the condition that it's in. Now, that may be true with Syria. Uh, it's not the case with subcontinent, not at all. I think Middle East, subcontinent, two very, very different issues. I think their argument of um, this uh, Western imperialism uh, fails uh, with the problem of Pakistan. That actually destroys their argument completely and actually gives evidence to something deeper, you know, something that... The, that's our narrative anyway, and I really think we need to step up and, and shout from the tops of, uh, top of our lungs uh, that we've known this forever and we, do, we know the problem and we know the way out in some way. Because I think the West is not hearing, and it's about time that they do. The Afghan peace deal, of course, is very problematic. Uh, I think we all expected more from this deal. Um, India is the greatest, um, it's going to be the one that's going to be affected the most from uh, when the U.S. troops pull out. I don't think anybody actually realizes this because you're going to leave a vacuum and that vacuum is going to be very quickly filled by, you know, Taliban forces controlled by the ISI and the military and uh, they're going to unleash all these ready-made uh, uh, jihadis uh, and terrorists uh, that are already ready, right? And there's going to be a lot more where that came from. And you won't have people to uh, hold anything, anyone accountable. And uh, guess what? They're all going to come. They're all very close to Kashmir border and so on. So, um, you know, it, we, we have to be very, uh, very careful. Um, what I will say is COVID has, I think it's kind of maybe given us a lifeline because I think it's just shuffled everything where even though this deal was signed, I just think everything is up in the air. And when things do settle down, if there happens to be an attack on some U.S. base, because remember the troops have not withdrawn yet, 
anything can happen. I mean, Trump can just cheer that agreement up. And uh, I think they, they may renege on it. They may renegotiate on it, which will be better for us. I think this is a time when maybe the U.S. Uh, diplomacy, the Minister of External Affairs and so on, I think they need to push a narrative that this is a very dangerous deal. It's not a good deal. Essentially, you are outsourcing your counterterrorism to the very terrorists that you were trying to wipe out. That is the best way of describing this peace deal in a nutshell. And I hope that they do take notice. So I just have hopes that uh, they will kind of uh, change their mind on it or they maybe postpone the withdrawing to quite further down the road when things do change. Uh, I will say that we have a great goodwill in uh, Afghanistan. We've spent two billion there over 20 years. We've done a lot of good for them. I know Afghanis love Indians and um, I think at some point we have to step up uh, you know, extend ourselves in a way that we haven't yet. I think there's a lot of room for us to get engaged, uh, even if it's sort of covertly, let's say, not overtly, but we can definitely support them in so many ways. I think uh, it would only help us. Now, I mean, there's a big argument, should we have troops on the ground there? I mean, it's not our war to fight in in one way, but it might end up being our war to fight. I definitely, I don't know about troops on the ground, but I think we definitely, definitely can do more. We have to make our voice heard and let people know that we are, uh, you know, we are in a very, very important player in this game. And uh, we need to give the U.S. something that it needs and nobody else can give it. There are many things can, that India can give the U.S. that no one else can. And unfortunately, we didn't step up decades ago when we could have, um, even when this whole Afghan thing even started in the first place. Um, Pakistan did. It absolutely stepped up. And it kind of sold the U.S. a bridge that the U.S. bought. Now the U.S. is really rethinking it. I think they know what's going on. They, you know, they, they're not that dumb, I would hope. They do get it. I think they're maybe stuck between a rock and a hard place as well. But um, we just need new people to come in and uh, realize that, you know, India is the way to go. I mean, Nikki Haley, who is Indian, she's Punjabi, uh, she very blatantly says, you know, we, um, Pakistan is the most dangerous country in the world and that's not an ally we can trust. And on the flip side, India should be our great ally. It's got everything that we look for and she's proud of her Indian heritage. I think she's all for a deeper U.S.-India relationship. My personal prediction is that in 2024, I think she has a great shot to become the U.S. president and she would be the first female president. Uh, and also she would be the first one of Indian origin uh, which is fantastic. I really would like to see that happen. So let's hope that that does. Um, and okay, the H1B1 B visa is uh, so uh, important. I don't think Indians or Americans realize that the H1B1 visa actually makes America great. You know, it. You know, we are essentially driving the technology sector in the U.S and making it so good, right? So uh, putting a stop to that actually hurts the U.S. more than it hurts India. And the U.S. needs to know that. And I think that that should be a big point if we want to vote for a certain administration. That's one of the tickets that we can use. We need to make sure that uh, our um, immigration will not be affected. Um, I think we have to be pragmatic. I know a lot of people talk about um, which side, you know, the Democrats, Republicans. I think we have to be pragmatic. I think there's a lot of people who just say, no, we must only vote Republican and they are the only party for us because the Democrats somehow, especially this progressive faction in um, uh, 
the Democratic Party seems to have taken this sort of very anti-India line. Uh, Bernie Sanders, of course, he had a Pakistani campaign manager and they were peddling all kinds of lies about Kashmir and they have taken very antagonistic uh, take on CAA, 370 and so on. They don't know anything about it, but yet they want to sort of smear India for no good reason. Uh, well, guess what? Bernie is no longer in the race, you know, and that should teach him and the rest of the progressives a lesson that it these things just don't fly. I mean, the Labour Party in the UK was decimated for many reasons, but one of the reasons was all the British Indians, the British Hindus especially, uh, did not vote for them. They voted Tory, and they are totally... Uh, conservative and they were a swing vote uh, a big one because they're you know you have to understand that in the UK but especially in the US the ethnic group that is the richest and the most educated happens to be Indian Americans and most of the, those are Hindus anyway so we actually have a lot of pull even though we are only four million uh, we are incredibly influential and we do donate to candidates. So I think these candidates really need to understand that uh, if they want our votes, if they want our support, they have to be India friendly, they have to be pro-India, certainly being pro-Jihad um, pro, pro and pro-Pakistan is not going to get you anywhere. Uh, I think the Indians here are a little bit naive, unlike the ones in the UK though. So. We hope that they kind of get the gist of what's going on. Uh, I see a comment here. I, I, I won't comment on it just yet, but yes, you're absolutely right. This trend towards globalization, uh, uh, sorry, this trend towards nationalism is the greatest wave between nationalism and socialism, uh, sorry, between nationalism and globalization. Nationalism wins between national security and, say, healthcare or identity politics, national security wins as well. So I think there's a lot of trends going on in the world, India and the US specifically, it's the same issues and we can see who is in power and who, who is being booted out, you know. So I, I um, have spoken, I've written many articles about my predictions as an analyst on this this upcoming election and I make no bones about it. I really think it's going to be one way and I'll talk about that at the very end. Um, the purchase of the S-400 from Russia was another antagonistic issue. Obviously the US wasn't pleased but uh, Secretary Pompeo recently at, a, uh, at an event with Dr. Jayashankar said he appreciates and respects and acknowledges India's need for territorial uh, integrity and uh, sovereignty and it will do what it needs to to protect its borders and to protect its citizens which he was referring to the S-400. There were no sanctions put on as far as I can guess and, and remember I think so they, we didn't have ramifications for that which was good um, and moving forward maybe we'll buy more things from the US so you know uh, India is the most armed uh, country in the world, which is interesting because we're also the land of Ahimsa. But remember, Ahimsa means um, protecting yourself by doing the least number of, uh, the least amount of damage to the other. It does not mean take it lying down. So to arm ourselves to the hilt is defense. Yes, it's sad that so much of our money and uh, resources go towards this. Uh, at the same time, we live in a very hostile neighborhood. We don't have very friendly neighbors. And I think just for not just India, but for the region and for the world at large, it's very important that India is safe and protected. Um, the oil, of course, is uh, kind of, uh, I think we've come to an impasse now because we no longer buy that much oil from Iran. Um, and you know, the Arab world's relationship with India is also not dependent on India's relationship with Israel because India and Israel obviously have been uh, 
they have had a great relationship. You know, they've always been allies in many ways. There are many parallels, I would say. Um, and I think the OIC countries, uh, or the, uh, all these, uh, you know, Arab countries, they've been a little antagonistic in the past. But I think we are seeing an enormous shift. Modi has done a fantastic job with wooing all of these leaders. I think today MBS is the most pro-India and pro-Hindu leader of Saudi Kingdom. I think all the, the Sheikh um, Maktoub and Sheikh Nehan and all the, the UAE Emirate, uh, the Emirate leaders are also very pro-India, not antagonistic at all. When 370 happened, not a word. Um, I think they all unanimously backed India. Uh, the whole world did really, other than the jihadis themselves and other than Pakistan and I think China too. Uh, you know, so we have the world on our side because I think we have truth on our side. Um, so the Arab world's relationship with India is no longer dependent on our perspective on the Israel-Palestine conflict or with our relationship with Israel. Uh, another thing to uh, keep in mind is the with the U.S. There's always going to be a main power, and then there's going to be a, um, a junior partner, right? So the you know with with Pakistan, for example, of course, the U.S. is going to be the main power. Pakistan will be the junior partner. Now, India, I don't think is okay being a junior partner. I don't think in any way it is a junior partner to anyone. So that's an interesting um, dance that the that both countries need to uh, sort of enact out. Uh, so the U.S. needs to realize that it d will not have a, a, a right to dictate to us who we can uh, have an alliance with, who we can talk to, who we can purchase, what we need from, right? It needs to have the respect and respect our sort of, we are a sovereign nation, you know, I mean, anything that happens within the borders of India, these are internal matters in a sovereign country. Uh, this also happens to be, uh, you know, the largest secular democracy in the world. In a few years, it's going to be the most populous. I don't think anybody has a right to tell India what to do. Um, and uh, also the U.S. cannot influence public policy in India. Uh, I think Indian policy should be independent it should never be influenced by how, what is the U.S. going to say about this? Is this going to be pro-U.S. or not? I mean, if we need to do something for our national security, we need to do it. You know, we are not here to please and appease another nation just for the hell of this relationship. Uh, China, you know, whatever you may think of China, especially after this COVID fiasco, China remains a a top trading partner of India. Much of India's future rise is going to be dependent on China, is going to be dependent on trade with China. Nobody is going to be shutting shop with China anytime soon. My prediction is that this lockdown will be in, uh, over, you know, it'll be uh, taken off. The whole world will be back to normal. It'll be business as, as usual. And uh, people will forget about it and, and, and things go on. So uh, we have to be smart and strategic about it. We have had a good working relationship, I think, with China all these years. We have so much trade between ourselves. Of course, some of that will move. Um, no matter what happens, I think we can never sort of shut down with China. I think it's, 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 it's our neighbor. It's a, another superpower in the region. In some ways, we again we have to dance together, uh, and um, that's just the way that it um, that it is. You know, I mean, these things are, uh, you know, we we uh, we have to be pragmatic and tactful. I think sometimes, uh, sometimes short-term kind of pragmatism will lead to a long-term success. And I think with China, we have a long future ahead. I also think that in many ways. Uh, China, it looks at India as its greatest rival, not the U.S., you know, but um, 
you know, they have an age of humiliation coming up. They have a very aging population. Nobody trusts China. No one particularly likes China. They are, um, uh, you know, they do trade with China because they are forced to. I think if anything, this COVID has um, uh, shown us that the world is over dependent on China and one should never be that over dependent to on one nation because when things like this happen everybody gets affected I think this COVID has actually shown that um, globalization does not work and pe countries are going to turn to isolation they're going to turn to nationalism and so on and they're going to really look at their allies and look at who they want to trust and who they don't want to trust so I think um, India is actually has a upper hand in that way because it's always been non-aligned, right? So it can continue to do that, and I have a feeling that many other countries will also be non-aligned now. Like they'll go the India way, I guess. Um, uh, scope of replacing China. I would love to say that we can take so much business from them, but it ain't going to happen. I think, uh, I mean, it could happen, but I just don't think that the government is doing what it needs to do. I also think that Taiwan and Vietnam and so on might actually get more benefit from this. I think there's a little that we will get uh, as a fallout. Hey, it's never too late. We can always change our ways. But this is on us. You know, there are times like this that... It's a gold mine in so many ways. I don't think you get chances like this all the time. I really think that the government of India needs to step up and stop, stop twiddling its thumbs and get on with it and um, just uh, really be strategic, be, be hawkish, you know, um, do what it needs to do. I mean, we have the labor. We, uh, we need some serious reforms. You know, we need economic reforms. I think we need labor reforms. Uh, we need all sorts of things to open up. There is way too much bureaucracy. I think we love to blame, you know, colonization and invasion and, uh, you know, even Congress, UPA rule and socialism and all that good stuff. But we honestly, even in the last 10 years or so, uh, much could have been done. Even the last six years, I think more could have been done. And we have ourselves to blame. I think we are no less, you know, uh, full of bureaucracy than we've ever been. And I think this bureaucracy is going to be the bane of our success. Uh, and we really need to take a good look at ourselves. And we need changes. This is a great time. I think we're ready for it in some ways. Um, okay, so... Um, you know, I, I, I just want to read something beautiful that Dr. Jay Shankar, uh, who I think is such a rock star, you know, he really is, I think, somebody who puts, makes India such a, 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 a he makes India look good. He makes India sexy, I think. But uh, recently he said, um, if we look at the growth of, of the areas of relationship between India and the U.S., the ability and willingness to work is there. I do see and hear an America that wants much more of a partnership relationship and management of world security. Um, you know, once we have a political and military comfort level, we can come into any situation with harmony and can collaborate on many global initiatives together, be it humanitarian, operations or counterterrorism activities relationships are never easy but the grand standing uh, grand strategy underwriting our relationship is basically sound it needs maintenance from time to time and sometimes even an upgrade um, great friends are bound to have differences you know um, I also think that the BRI, the famous Belt and Road Initiatives, the world is realizing that it comes not just with strings attached, but with shackles. And I'm happy to say that I think the CPEC is not going to fly. I think that's a corridor to nowhere. You know, this is a, a, this is a highway to hell uh, for all intents and purposes. And 
I'm happy. I think it's going to uh, kind of backfire on both Pakistan and China. And I think China is really waking up to the fact and realizing that this is like a like a non-entity and a big mistake. Um, finally, I just want to say that, uh, you know, as the rift between the United States and China increases, this is a great opportunity to, for India to step up. And we are more than just a um, you know a shoulder for the U.S. to 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 take aim at China with, right? I mean, India's opportunity to prove itself as a global leader becomes more imperative. I think that um, this is really a clash of civilizations, uh, as pointed out by Dr. Samuel Huntington in his famous book. Um, the India-U.S. relationship, I predict, is going to be the most important relationship for the next few decades. In many ways, this century is India's, right? Um, with its um, economy, with its population and its rising influence in the world, the U.S. and the world cannot ignore it anymore. We are going to get our, our seat at the table. There's a famous say, saying, if you don't have a seat at the table, then you're on the menu. I think we've been on the menu for a long time, and I think it's time that we demand a high chair, and uh, slowly we're going to go to the very head of the table. So history compels and destiny beckons that these two great nations will dance in the future. So I predict a great future for the two nations, and uh, let's see how history unfolds. So with that, I want to end my talk. I hope you uh, got a few pointers and you enjoyed it. Now I will, um, I will take questions, you know. So uh, I don't know. There is, um... okay, let's, let's start with, I'm seeing some fantastic questions already. Sawai Singh Raj Purohit is asking me, as a journalist, you may have a very good understanding of the present image of Donald Trump in the States. What are the views of the general public on the Kashmir issue? Great question. Kashmir issue, I think, um, I'm happy to say the public sentiment is fine. Either people are indifferent about it or, you know, I think the whole world kind of backed India on this. The only problems is uh, in mainstream media, which tends to be very left-leaning, and academia. So in universities, there was some, there was some hoo-ha about Kashmir. And in, of course, the, the usual suspects of the left-leaning media, they had all these horrible headlines and all that. But when you look at pe people in general, they didn't really um, have anything negative. I think it's divided, though. I think when you look at conservatives, you look at Republicans, they had either an indifferent or even a positive view of this Kashmir thing. I think with the Democrats, unfortunately, it was very divided. And even within the Democratic Party, the the more establishment Democrats didn't really care so much. But these so-called progressive ones, which are, I think, the most dangerous in all of the American political system, they were a little, uh, yeah, they were very anti-India and they were really trying to smear India. But uh, then Bernie's gone now and all of those other foo-foo people have gone as well. So, you know, uh, I, you know, it, it's interesting because the Kashmir issue actually wasn't as big as the CAA. Kashmir kind of came and went. Everybody accepted it. We moved on. The CAA event, unfortunately, was... Um, very, uh, I, I don't think anybody expected the fallout. I think the government did a terrible job of putting forth their narrative. I think with Kashmir, they did something to inform the world after, but CAA was terrible. So like really bad, man, the government of India, you really need to step up, man. You need to hire a PR machine, I think. You need to hire a serious um, lobby you know, uh, you know, moving forward for for India, they need to set up lobbies in Washington. They need to seriously spend money, get individual, get the NRIs together. We have 
one advocacy group, I think. We need several. We need plenty of rich Indians to donate and set up shop. And, you know, I mean, we got money to, to flounder around. I mean, that's what Pakistan does. You know, they are excellent at PR and brand Pakistan and image building and lobbying. They are experts. We are terrible. That's why we are in the... Um, uh, in the situation that we are in today, right? So I really think we need to come together and invest. We have not done that, right? Uh, the, um, what else? If India supports, so this is from Ayush K. Sharvani. If India supports Balochistan and Taiwan in standing on their own feet, uh, with Balochistan shall act as a buffer stage between Taliban and Afghanistan or if um, Balochistan will be a buffer between uh, Afghanistan and the US uh, I mean for us Iran will be that sort of passage in a way and if we have troops they will end up uh, sort of being the middle ground uh, Balochistan breaking away is very important for them because it really weakens the Pakistani state. Pakistan is firstly the only artificial country in the world. It's just a few different provinces that got lumped together. They have no identity. It's the only country in the world that has zero identity and whose identity is uh, what it's not, right? It's not India, it's not Hindu. That's essentially the Pakistani identity. So, um, it, uh, I mean, it will really weaken it, right? And that's what we want. We just want them to stop the cross-border terrorism and stop sort of funding terrorism around the world. Um, but it, it, you know, a, a free Balochistan only helps us. So we must be more active there as well in so many ways. Uh, even if, again, if you don't want to have troops there, I think there is so much uh, scope to help them in so many ways. Also, um, POK, of course, that's a huge issue. I Look, it's Indian territory. I think you need to make up your mind. How badly do you want it? If you want it, you must fight for it. You cannot let it go away. I think we made blunders and we let it go so easily because that Gilgit and Baltistan region is very important. I think there are parts of POK that you can forget about honestly and some parts are infested with hostiles and terrorists you don't want that but i think there's like gilgit and baltistan and there's some other spots that actually are very important on so many levels and that belongs to india so i think whether you want the state to weaken and eventually it falls into your lap or you want to really go fight for it and, and get it back you need to do something about it i i would suggest don't let it go because it's your territory, right? It's part of Bharat. Uh, and there's, yes, um, so Joy Aditya Pukan uh, is saying that BJP was unable to explain the CAA. Um, true, it was unable to explain it. Shame on them. They could have done a better job because it actually, it's very, uh, it explains speaks for itself it's a completely democratically um uh, you know sort of uh, passed in the parliament uh, with an enormous majority this is as legitimate and legal as it comes india has a prerogative to do that there's the lautenberg amendment in the us which is does exactly the same thing we could have quoted that we could have seriously put together a lobby they didn't do that they didn't even have official statements um, after the lockdown, this issue will rise again, possibly. Maybe the lockdown will be so heavy that maybe that, you know, situation won't rise. Maybe they'll find other fish to fry. Uh, yes, we must be more resilient. I think we have to explain the issue. I think we need people not just from the government of, of India, but we need the some of some NRIs. You know, we need some talking heads from America that speak to American media. I mean, I've done a lot of it and I hope to do a lot more. Uh, but yes, we need to, somebody needs to explain to them what it is because I have a feeling that they don't know. Uh, absolutely. You know, we have a right to uh, protect persecuted minorities uh, in 
uh, these countries where they are heavily persecuted. I think it's a humane thing to do. I don't see anything wrong with it. Someone is asking me um, about CPEC. Yes, I said it's uh, the road, uh, it's the highway to hell. So a lot of money has been pumped in. I think what is it, the latest figures, what, 19 million, I think, has has been pumped into it. Uh, or 19 billion, maybe, I don't know. But uh, a lot has been pumped into it and with no results. I think China is realizing that they are not going to get any return on their investment because Pakistan keeps stalling these projects on its own. I think this was sort of a great idea for both, and yet it's not going to work out because, I mean, these are so supposedly loans, right? Pakistan is never going to pay any of this back. China is not going to, you know, they have to get something out of China in exchange for this. Um, and also the whole BRI thing as a whole, it's obviously beyond CPEC, it, you know, uh, the all parts of the South China Sea and then you go into Africa, uh, they're having problems everywhere, you know, and they're also the Africa Chinese dynamic, there's a lot of racial tension there too. So this is not working out well for China. And it was a, just a huge, grandiose, imperialistic project for them that is not tenable or feasible. They're losing a lot more money than they had thought they would. So, um, you know, I, I, I'm not concerned about uh, CPEC for sure. BRI as a whole, I'm, it's, it is problematic. Also, uh, they would have to go through POK, which is, again, Indian land. This is, I think, uh, I think India has a good case here. I think this is when it needs to step up on an international level, maybe take it to the court, or international courts and say, this is Indian sovereign land and it's illegal for you to build things and pass through it and so on. You, you cannot do that, actually. It kind of the whole thing will, will get um, plebiscite, Kashmir, all of that will be, will, 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 will resurrect, let's say, and it only helps India. Somebody had an interesting question. Uh, Rugved Upadhyay is saying, will Modi-Trump relationship help Trump with votes of Indian Americans in the presidential elections and with what magnitude? Very good question. So, number one, look, Indian American, it's a small group, it's 4 million, and of those who vote is even less than 4 million. However, Indians are in, uh, they live in, they live all over the country, but they live in uh, swing states, right? They, they live in states where they could make a difference. And l this election is going to go down to, to the wire. I think the swing states will be uh, very crucial. And I think that's when they come in, right? So the margin is small but I think they can make a difference. I think if there's a huge Republican turnout and the Democrats decide to stay at home, that's when this Indian vote actually gets very important. I do think that the, the Trump victory will be better for India. You know, I would like to see more action than just rhetoric, but even the problem is you're not even going to get the rhetoric with the, with the Democrats. That's the issue. Right. I think they have pushed us to the right. They have left us with no other options. So we, we uh, have no choice in a way, whether we want to or not. I think it may, if, you know, you got to pick. And uh, I think there's a clear winner here. Uh, what else? Amit Ram Chandra Singh saying, what strategies do you think is required between EU, the U.S. and India to contain China and make it accountable for its misdeeds? I would love to say that, yes, we will, we will sanction China, we will ban China, uh, stop all you know, trade, and India is going to be the new China. It, none of that will happen, unfortunately. I think trade is so deeply intertwined globally. Um, both the U.S. and India are so heavily dependent on China that you can't just pull out. Uh, I think there's going to be a gradual weaning. I think people have had it. I think public sentiment is really negative. 
if there are other options, people will take it. And there do seem to be other options, right? So let's hope that um, uh, India can, uh, you know, can, can kind of get some of the residue and step up as a leader. I, I would like to see the U.S. be a little bit more accountable. They have to take some action, some kind of sanction or question them or and the WHO as well, right? Well, these people put a lid on this. Uh, there's going to be a recession. The whole global economy is screwed. So you have to, um, you know, if somebody has needs to be <laughs> held accountable. Somebody needs to be fired. And that hasn't happened yet. So I do want to see some actions being taken. Let's go up. Yes, China did want this situation. I think this has shown uh, this perils of globalization. Uh, when you're so connected in some ways, something goes wrong, it's a domino effect, and that's just very dangerous, I think. Let's go up. It's an interesting question. This is from Joy again. In your opinion, will reclaiming POK and Gilgit Baltistan eradicate terrorism or, or will it eradicate by redefining Islam, Kafir Jihad? Interesting question. Um, I think uh, much of this comes into um, it will be answered by do we fight? Do we go and get POK back or does it gradually fall? fall into our arms if it if it's a gradual thing then then um i think the whole situation will be much more sort of mellow if we are gonna you know go there and push their their th those hostiles out and, and really claim it then i i mean that that is sort of i wouldn't call it war but that's a serious conflict you know, international community will get involved. I mean, that's uh, that's more than a surgical strike. That's something else. Um, I don't know about eradicating. I think the, the the problem with that region is even if somehow you get, I mean, Kashmir is hostile enough for us. But when you get, you know, whatever the POK region back, that's full of host hostiles as well. There's all kinds of militancy, insurgencies there. Um, you got to be careful. I think you have to ask yourself what is really, really essential and worth it. And I think you should go after that. I think you should be tactical with this. Let's see what else. Padam Sanchetti says, I deal in pure China products. Should I continue or is it an exit point? No, continue. You know, like, hey, do what you need to do. You know, I mean, you have your bottom line. Uh, wait for other options. There may be other options. You know, there's, there's things will pop up. You know, and until that time, just to do what you need to do. Um, and when there is a better option, maybe even India might be a better option. Then you should make that switch absolutely. Yes. So Dr. Vivek Call uh, is asking. Tell us about think tank information. Uh, think think tank formation in Washington to further our causes so important so the of course the observer research foundation which is a number one think tank in india uh, who i've worked with and spoken at they are setting up they have set up their washington branch that's a start that's one think tank i think we need more and they are many conservative think tanks i think we need our you know desis and you know dharmic sanatani is joining those think tanks because we have a lot of political scientists out there and somehow they always go for the left think tanks which are the famous ones but you know we have hudson institute you've got heritage foundation there are many uh, i'm thinking of joining some of these think tanks myself uh, finding the right one i think we need to put forward our case because the thing is with the right think tank, your your voice is exactly what they need to hear, right? So it's so important that we have lobbies, that we have think tanks. Um, the big problem, of course, is academia, media. I think we need to set up, uh, you know, we have student groups who are against us. I think we have to have student groups that are for us or uh, more sort of Sanatani student associations, let's say, like this one. 
uh, that is getting speakers and uh, mobilizing people, supporting them and so on. It's so important, I think. Yes, um, India has actually great potential for in the manufacturing business. I think we have rightfully so we're focused on um, services, you know, because that's, I think, uh, an area where we don't have competition. Manufacturing, there's plenty of competition, but services, no. But I, I think, I mean, we, we, we produce in everything, whether it's milk, sugar, wheat, rice, tea, uh, tobacco, uh, we are the top three, and in many cases, the number one producer of these things in the world. And some of them, we are the number one exporter in the world. So there's no reason why we can't do more. I think for all these Amazon, Apple, all of these companies, Samsung, you know, many more to set up manufacturing hubs and all sorts of hubs in India will be the way to go. But we need foreign investment for this and we need to. So again, get rid of bureaucracy. You need to make it so easy for um, foreign companies to come and open businesses and set up shop. It should be the easiest thing. Why are we making it difficult? You know, this is I keep hearing from U.S. companies and think tanks and stuff. They said, we love you. We much prefer doing business with you, but you make it so hard. You, you, it's hell to do business here. It's too much. We get turned off and we don't. We can't stand China, but it's so easy. Right. So I think much more needs to be done in this area. Parijat is saying political leaders and ministers are the reflection of people's mindset. This is true. Talking about Indo-US, both nations have profit-minded leaders. I would say one nation has profit-minded leader. Leader, Yeah, I would love to say it's both, but I don't think so. I think we're still very much a, a, a welfare state. Uh, I mean, yes, we have to take care of our weakest, but I think we need to be about prosperity and profit and capital gain and capitalism and you open it up market access uh, get rid of tariffs invite business in why are we making it tougher for people to buy things and do business here um, yeah it, it has uh, I mean to your question I don't think that India is got pro profit pro profit uh, leadership right now I wish it did um, Look, we have had the worst governance for the last 60 years with UPA that any country can ever dread of having. So whatever we have now, with all its flaws, it's still a million times better than what we had, right? So we uh, can never sort of forget that. I think sometimes take things with a grain of salt, you know, look at the whole picture. But I think there's so much scope. I would like to see in the next few years we really have these economic reforms and open our markets up, make it easier to do business, get rid of bureaucracy, get NRIs involved. You know, I find more patriotic people here uh, outside of India who will do anything and they love the BJP and they love Modi and so on. And even the, the, the Sanghi network outside of India is so strong. Right. These people are dying for an opportunity to get involved with the government. So they must be given an opportunity. OK. Yes, you're right. Arthi Patel. Uh, yes, we, we, we no country has a right to meddle in uh, internal affairs of a sovereign nation. And I think with the, some of these progressive people, they need to just stop meddling in um, a you know, the largest democracy in the world. Uh, right wing is absolutely, well, populism and nationalism, I think, is the right, uh, is the new trend in the world. Ground level image of Donald Trump is, uh, believe it or not, his ratings are still very high because I think he has a base that is very dedicated. These people also do not want socialism. They do not want Bernie. They do not want Biden. They don't want anyone from the left. They will come together and they will vote for whoever is the Republican nominee who there is no other com competitor at this point. Um, before this COVID, he, he was soaring. 
his image was extremely positive. He can use this COVID as a plus for him. He can say, hey, I managed it and, you know, uh, but unfortunately, the economy has taken a dive. People are dying here. This country has not managed the situation well at all. There is going to be a recession in America. We don't even know if there will be an election. I just hope that there will be an election because I have a feeling they might be postponed or whatnot. Um, let's see what happens. I still feel that his base will come out and vote for him. I think he's safe. Um, okay. Miss Pretty is really pretty. Thank you, Joy. Your lips say, okay, all right, thank you. <laughs> um, oh, I think this is when they can't hear me. Uh, Saideep is saying Pakistan has been taken at a very light note by the Western nation. Uh, yes, it has. I think people is, uh, the world is re learning about what Pakistan is about and they're not impressed i think the uk see the uk is a lot of pakistani born you know of pakistani origin uh, but because of this islamophobia threat people can't be too open and uh, and if you do you get locked up right so you got to be careful yes but the west is seeing i think they've had enough um, I want to, the EU to see that. I, I think UK is more or less awake. I think you need Scan you need Scandinavia, you need Germany, you need France, you need Europe, Western Europe to see this. You need America to see this. Uh, Australia does kind of see it. I think New Zealand is a bit of a gone case. Canada is a really gone case, right? So I think uh, there's some hope, but others are not the rise of Taliban is the biggest threat to India well I don't know but I mean I would say the ISI is uh, the ISI is you know um, and and I would say China is as well much more why doesn't UN peace forces ever step in Afghanistan um, that's an interesting question. You know, the, the people think that the UN has much more uh, power than it actually does. Firstly, it's not binding. You know, it's not some legitimate, legally binding organization that people have to listen to it. All the resolutions and everything, all of that is still, it's just like a prescription, you know. I mean, people go do what whatever they want to do. I think the U.S. Uh, forces ha have been there, right, for almost 20 years. So their whole thing was, hey, we are here, so we don't need... Uh, I'm not so sure what those forces would do. I think they are also very clueless about what's actually going on. Like, they don't really know, they don't un understand the, the ISI web. India has the upper hand. Yes, it does. Uh, I do hope we use the opportunity left by India. I, I, we haven't done it yet. But let's see. Okay, so this is the very... So let me go to the very end and see if there have been any new questions. There have been some new questions. Chaitanya Kashyap is asking, do you think that China is going to be the big daddy in the global economy when normalcy is restored? No, I don't think so. Look, the US is by and large the big daddy. Yeah, no. India will be the... The smaller daddy, I think, in 20, 30 years from now, I'm sure. In fact, some analysts predict that it's going to be the largest economy 50 years, I mean, what, 30, 40 years from now, maybe. I think uh, China stocks are going to fall a little bit. This pandemic will come back. You know, just nobody's going to trust China. I think the people do want to move on and they will be slow weaning. I think we will realize how dependent we, we were on them and their plans. And now everybody's finding out about the BRI. I think the Western world and, of course, India needs to come together and sort of uh, put their foot down in some way. You know, I don't think it's going to be overt, but it sort of subtle, more, more subversive, I think. 
capitalism is sexy. I think it is. I certainly don't think socialism is, you know, but tell that to the to the Marxists. How do you see the Western media presence in India? Very, very uh, dangerous uh, presence, I think. I don't think Indians should be giving these outlets the, the uh, power, you know, we make them famous. There is no need to do that. They have very little credibility, even in the West. Even in America, they have very, very little credibility because all they, they, they do is smear and lie. And a lot of the predictions and elections and so on have gone completely wrong. Right. So it's I don't think Indian people and Indian outlets should ape the West. Why are we copying their headlines? Also, a lot of this smearing in the West of India comes from, you know, the the Liberando Brigade here, right? Because these Western outlets don't have a presence in India. You know, they have, their sources are the, the Liberandos, right? So they l get their information from them and uh, that's how they all get these lies and these all this misinformation and uh, that needs to stop. I don't know how it's going to stop. I just think that maybe there need to be more outlets, more journalists who are doing good work. Um, somebody needs to educate, I think, the Western media. Um, look, also these Western media outlets, they get their funding from certain places and wherever the money comes from, that's, where that, that's who sets the narrative. And unfortunately, we're seeing a very certain narrative and we know where the funds are coming from. So maybe we have to throw some money around as well. Sanatana Dharma rocks absolutely does. Um, Vivekananda International Foundation is the most influential think tank in India right now. Um, I have heard of them. I have, um, yes, I think it is absolutely, uh, well, specifically for foreign policy, I think. ORF has done well. I think to market and brand itself, it has a, it's more sexier, let's say, you know, and also the name and all that. And also they put on the Raisina dialogues where, which I spoke at this year, and it was a fabulous event with all these heads of states there. Um, that's a great event. Uh, they should do more of that. You know, India needs to do much more of that in Washington. And I hope it does. Do you think the pandemic is a turning point for the geopolitical scenario? Absolutely. Because I think the whole world order has been revealed. I think we know who the good guys are. We know who the bad guys are. We know who has stepped up. We know who hasn't. Even the U.S. hasn't stepped up, to be quite honest. They've been very shambolic. And um, India has. You know, this is a time for India to gloat and say, hey, look, man, we... We, we gave you medicines, we saved lives. Look how, how well India has managed this thing. I mean, 1.3 billion people, what we have 2,000, maybe 3,000 fatalities. Come on, that is a ridiculously low amount. We have done many things right, you know, and the US hasn't and Europe hasn't. So this is where we really need to put, put forward our case, I think. Interesting question, how many Indians might have died in this pandemic? Hard to say, I don't know if they've counted it by race. I know it's a lot of uh, people in general. I think New York was very affected because it's very congested. I know California has not been affected that much, thank God. There's a lot of Indians in California, but then there's also a lot of Indians in New Jersey, right? So hard to say. Let's see. The, any more questions? Okay, here we go. There are some more questions. Lots of more questions. Okay. Chaitanya says, ma'am, it's been predicted that by 2030, China is going to be the largest economy. I'm not so sure that's going to... I think 2030 is too soon. Also, they have their own problems coming up, you know, when they're a very aging population, right? They have some issues of their own. Um, if they ever overtake, right, um, 
it's I don't think 10 years is is enough I think it'll be more than that but at some point it will I mean it has a population too but then of course I, India will be the most uh, populous country I think in a few years uh, but China might not have the sustained growth for the next 20 years you know and with an aging population certainly they won't I think time will tell let's see you know and I think China is a pariah and you know what if any if if this pandemic has taught us anything it's that it's not just about the economy it's not just about money and trade it's about morality it's about trust it's about respect it's about who likes you and i'm sorry but china has failed in all of those levels um there was one question Preeti, your thoughts on the restructuring of the UN Security Council? Absolutely. Fantastic time, I think, for India to make its case again. Look, it's inevitable that I don't, I don't think the largest country, the most populous country, the largest secular democracy, the one that has the best record um, of not invading and conquering, the oldest civilization in the world, I don't think it's okay that that nation does not have a permanent seat at the council. I don't think these councils mean anything, but but um, especially when you're not in the permanent circle. But but I just don't think it's going to fly. I think it's inevitable. Uh, I would say if there was a vote other than China and Pakistan, most countries would it would be overwhelming. Yes, for India. I think uh, when all of this simmers down, I think that's when we make our case. I think it needs to be done when Dr. Jay Shankar is, is still involved uh, and, and Modi too, because they actually are rock stars and every there's an incredible num uh, amount of respect for both of them and they have to champion this forward. The UN, of course, yes, needs more reforms too. Um, some terrorists have been identified as global terrorists. They have. Um, who are residing in Pakistan. So I think what Pakistan does is it's, it's does this sort of cat and mouse game, right? It tells the UN and the US that it's taking care of them, that it's finding or has captured these so-called terrorists and they've shut shop and stuff. They haven't. But nobody's there on the ground to, 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 uh, to actually see for themselves. I think maybe one of the things, you, you know, we are not very good at propaganda. You know, we get smeared a lot. We're not very good at smearing. I think this is a time when maybe we need to hold Pakistan more accountable with this situation, you know, uh, because we know about the training camps around uh, uh, along the uh, LOC. So, right, this is when we really need to, uh, you know, kind of, uh, I mean, what have we, we been doing for the last 70 years? We have not been sharing all of this stuff enough, I think, for people. We cannot ignore China. 50% of the meds get their raw materials from China. That is very true. That's why I said you can never just completely walk away. I think you somehow have to find replacements. I don't think it'll ever happen, but you can reduce it. I think that's the best you can do. Thanks to Congress, we don't have the infrastructure. We don't, but we don't have Congress anymore. Uh, we're still a, a good manufacturing hub, you know, I think with some um, investment and some reforms and stuff. I mean, we still produce a ton of farm, you know, pharmaceuticals. It's a huge industry in India. Could be one of the top pharma, pharmaceutical sort of nations in the world. Yes, we definitely need peace in the Asian Middle East. If price is a matter of concern, then Indians must, must purchase Chinese products. That's true. Um, we got to do better maybe with uh, giving some kind of assurances because, you know, China has, yeah, they're cheaper. They're also faultier. Quality is worse. That's a, that's a tactic you can use, you know, hey, it's cheaper, but you have to come back in a few months and replenish it. So, you know, at least maybe we can start buying Indian made products more. I don't know you. 
I accidentally landed on this session today. Your knowledge about everything is superb. Where can I follow your live sessions? You're amazing. Please answer this. Oh, thank you, Padmas. Thank you so much. Uh, I, at the end of this, I will let all of you know where you can find me for sure. Um, I mean, actually, maybe I should do it now before people disappear. Um, so you can, I'm all over. Firstly, Facebook, Preeti Upala, P-R-E-I-T-Y, U-P-A-L-A. -A. I have a personal page and I have a public figure page. Um, join either. Just send me a message. I will respond. I'm very engaging. YouTube, it's Preeti Upala. And you can find all my videos there. Um, I have my, uh, my radio show is on iHeartRadio. But really, it's the YouTube channel that I'm pushing uh, I put, I do a lot of interviews all around the world. I do my talks, my speeches and events and all that. I always try to upload everything on, on YouTube. So my channel is, I'm trying to grow it. So please subscribe and get everyone to subscribe. But, uh, and please like and comment and share. Uh, I write a lot. So to find my articles, uh, if you just go to Google and write it, Preeti Upala journalist or Preeti Upala articles or specifically if you if you write in Preeti Upala Kashmir, uh, India, US, um, all of those things, I I'll, I'll, my articles will pop up. I write for Jerusalem Post, Times of Israel, Foreign Policy News and The Observer, which is based here in California. Uh, among I write for probably 15 other outlets as well. On Medium, I have my own channel. Uh, or portal or whatever again it's just my name and you'll find all my my articles I regularly circulate them um, so uh, you know please make sure you connect with me and on YouTube just send me a message I'll give you my email address just email me it's m i s s p dot productions with an s at the end at gmail.com uh, if you email me I'll even give you my whatsapp number so you can be connected uh, social media accounts, yes. Twitter, it's at Preeti Upala, but it's got two U's. Uh, IG, Instagram, is Preeti U, so P-R-E-I-T-Y, just the letter U. You'll find me. Ah, okay. Joy is saying, uh, I also want to be part of your work on Shakti. Thank you so much. So, I'm writing it at the moment. I'm speaking to editors. I'm speaking to publishers. I do think this is going to be a phenomenal book. It's going to be an important book for men and women. I think for Indian boys and girls to understand this divine feminine. I think it's so important. And I really think that school students, university students, people like yourself are the right market for it. So I will uh, uh, keep posted, uh, keep connected with me. I will always put updates out. Uh, whether it goes through a traditional publisher or a, um, you know, I don't know how I'll end up publishing it, but I'm sure it'll be on Amazon and all that. But I will make sure I, I will do a big launch and a PR road rally for that. So and hopefully I'll be doing talks around India and top universities. So you must invite me to all your universities. Very good question by Dhruvan Mod. Do you think that Bernie Sanders supporters will come out and vote for Joe Biden? No, they will not. Uh, I think they're antithetical to Biden. They did not come for Hillary and they will not be coming for Joe Biden. Also, I think there will be a lot of non-Bernie people who might not come out for Joe Biden either because he just doesn't seem like he's all there. He is, I think, going cuckoo. Um, I don't know who his vice president is going to be, but if he has someone like Kamala Harris, who is half Indian, by the way, she is d despised. Um, if they have Elizabeth Warren, no one trusts her because she lied. I, they, I don't know who his vice president is going to be, but um, if he doesn't pick the right one, he, he's going to be destroyed. I think he's going to be destroyed anyway. My prediction is Trump wins. Uh, he really does on so if there is an election, he will win. Uh, what is your opinion about this government and people saying they failed an economy due to, due to a few steps like demonization? As you praise our honorable prime minister, but the promises made... 
earlier are failed as part from COVID. Um, this government, like I said, I always look at everything in context. I would say that relative to the 60 years of atrocious governance that we had, I think we're still, this is still better. Um, we had a lot of expectations. I think a lot of bold steps were made. They can't go back on some of these things which they're starting to. 370 was monumental, I think. CAA can be monumental. I think especially 370, you can't fiddle with that. You cannot mess that up. It's too big of a thing. And you were smeared so much for it. You have to make sure that it works for you. Honorable Prime Minister has, you know, he's got a huge um, name, fan following around the world. Uh, Whatever is happening in India, somehow people still, he's still a rock star. You have to understand that almost every leader out there is, no, nobody is impressed with them, especially now. I think Modi is maybe the most likable global leader right now in India and outside of India, right? We have to keep that in mind. And he's done a phenomenal job, I think, with the COVID in terms of measures and how few people have been affected. It has been phenomenal with that. Um, I think that they need to get their trade right, get some of, of reforms, labor laws, things like that. I think their big thing is get foreign investment, really fix up the bureaucracy and get your PR right. I think the things that it needs to do are actually maybe more uh, straightforward and simpler. You know, the, some of the difficult things have been done. So it should be simpler for them. Uh, you know, everybody makes promises. Usually politicians lie and fail to deliver anything. I think whatever you've managed to get from this government is maybe more than more than what you what you ever could have got in some ways. Um, how can we help in your cause? Uh, subscribe, email me, be connected. When my book comes out, please, please, please um, uh, buy it and share it. I should set up a Patreon account, I think. I get a feeling. I don't have one, but I think I should set up one of those communities. Then you can all be a part of it, and I'll do many more of these. My project Shakti is, I'm writing a book on Shakti. That's the project Shakti. It's a book on uh, real feminism. And it's um, critiquing the Western idea of feminism. But I think this is important for Indian boys and girls. Because I think they, all, they always look to the West. And they think, oh, the West has these great concepts. Look at our concepts. They're so regressive. It's not true. It's the other way around. And I think that's what I'm trying to prove. Hindus for Trump. Um, well, I'm a member of many WhatsApp groups called Hindus for Trump. Um, I would only say be pragmatic because um, you got to understand that there's a lot of Christian right stuff happening in the Republican Party too. I mean, you know, the, the, there's the evangelical issue there. They're all about conversions and India is very attractive to them for conversions and you don't want that. You know, you got to be very careful. But I would say if you're going to pick between the two, I would say one is clearly better than the other. Uh, this government promised to bring back all the black money. Well, I guess black money isn't that easy to, to get back. Um, look, I mean, this, you know, Malia and Chitambaram and Nirav Modi, all these people. I want to see by the end of the second term, I want all these people locked up. You know, I think if these top few are locked up, I think that's a huge win for India. They need to be, the money needs to be recouped. But these, they're criminals, you know, and they're, I think it will be very good for the morale of the country because I think this Indian state has failed the people. It hasn't, you know, when has the black money ever come back? I think it's time to catch some of these people and it's, well within their right to do so. Woohoo, Trump's in the Badiar. I think so. I think it's going to happen. I mean, I wrote an article, which uh, I, I hope you find it, or maybe I'll put a link. Um, I'll post on uh, the Think India wall uh, some of my uh, recent articles on the elections, my predictions. I think you'll really enjoy it. And I make a very clear case who I think is going to win. And I don't vote for any party. 
I'm not a member of any political party in the world. I'm not supporting any politician in the world. Uh, this is a analytical, logical, non-partisan, non-biased uh, electoral analysis. That, that's all that it is. And I've tried to take my, my, myself out of it, equation, and uh, just um, tell people what I think is going to happen. Which is best for India? Yeah, Trump, for sure. Definitely, the Democrats know. You know. Who has more chances of winning? I think Trump does. Yes, uh, Sacha Bharat. Make an India start up. India, yes, we need this. We definitely need. I mean, we have them in place. We just need to actually make it in India. Can I help in any way in the Shakti Pro? Yes, please. Uh, uh, e e I'll give you my email address again. It's m i s s p dot productions with an s at the end at gmail dot com. Email me. Uh, subscribe to my YouTube channel and find me and connect with me. And when the book is ready, I will send it to all of you. Uh, guys, and you can help tweet and, uh, you know, uh, purchase it, share it, whatever. I think it will be uh, such an exciting thing. And when I, when the book is ready, you have to organize uh, talks in your university or so on. I will definitely come for that. Please call my name, Harshit Sinha. All right. <laughs> uh, Adva Arjun, it, is Trump also uh, part of the Bilderberg group? I don't know because I don't think he's deep state. I don't think it's establishment. They don't like him. He's doing things that they are, are dreading. You know, I mean, they are people that are part of this Illuminati or this sort of old world order. I don't think he's part of that in that way, right? And uh, Orchid Pankaj, thank you so much for uh, putting my email address there. May Janta Ho, okay. Someone in Hindi is writing. You are great. Okay, that's very sweet. Um, oh, uh, somebody was asking me about, well, I uh, work with think tanks and as a uh, journalist for several years covering specifically these issues, uh, Middle East policy, uh, Kashmir, U.S.-India relations, uh, counterterrorism and international affairs. So I've been writing about them for many years for a multitude of foreign policy publications and stuff. Uh, and when you go to think tanks, you meet with other great minds and you have access to resources and research and stuff. The research is out there on all of these things. The, none of these are, it's not my personal view or sentiment or rhetoric. I mean, this is, as a, as a researcher or, or an al analyst, you look at the data, right? Everything that I've said, the data backs it up. So, and the data is out there for everybody to see. You know, you don't have to be genius these days to know what's right from wrong. So I'm sh so shocked when I find uh, people making mistakes or foreign policy gone so wrong because uh, it shouldn't be that hard, you know, to know what's going on. But I think, sadly, fewer people have um, are privy to that or even care about digging up the truth, you know, uh, to, um, to know what's up. So, so thank you so much. I'm going to wait another minute or so to see if there's any, any more questions. Um, let's see. Thank you so much. You're all loving it. That's exciting. So I don't know if the lockdown is going to be removed in India soon, but well, I guess it'll be back to some sort of the new normal, I guess. You know, I, I, you know, I think this COVID has done, I think India has come out of it unscathed in many ways. It, it is the largest country in the world that has been affected the least, which is great. And I think the air and the water is cleaner. And, um, you know, people are can get together with their family. I think, you know, we always had a sattvic lifestyle anyway, but I think that's another good thing is like the whole world is doing the namaste and, 
you know, vegetarianism and all sorts of interesting things that, that we've been doing for thousands of years. And I think this is a time for us to push this way of living because, hey, you know, it's, we have a framework that works. The world doesn't even know that this framework exists. So this is what bugs me. And I think part of my, you know, uh, dharma, I think, is to sort of share this civilizational wisdom. Okay. 2020 vaccinations, hell no, stay away from them. I, I would not take them myself. Is India's personal born homie with Trump? Humphrey for India, no. I think the largest democracy in the world and the oldest democracy in the world ought to be friendly with each other. They ought to have chemistry. I think it's high time that the leaders of these two nations have chemistry because for far too long they have been very adversarial. The leaders never got along. Uh, George Bush, maybe that was the, the best so far, and that's, that's saying a lot. But... Um, no, I think it's only a good thing. I just think that we shouldn't take it for granted. I think talk is nice, optics are great, but I think we need actual policy at the end. Do you think there's any transparency when it comes to trade? Uh, I mean, there may be transparency, but I think our problem is is bureaucracy, you know, from our end and maybe from their end tariffs. Yeah, I mean, there ha there was a lot of corruption, I think, with UPA. And I think with this one, not so much. And definitely, at the very high levels, they are incorruptible, right? And the, 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 nobody right now is in power at the very top for money, right? This is not for fame and money. This is, this is genuinely a project to make India great again, you know, in some way, and bring it back to its old glory, and really clean it up and elevate it and make it into this uh, the, the dharmic state that it is already. So um, that's why the, the personal corruption is not an issue. Yeah, it's true. Uh, it, I think we've had enough optics for the year. We need policy, policy, policy. We need action, uh, sanctions, fines, whatever you need to do. But uh, I, I, I want to see stuff happening, not just talk, because I think we've had enough talk. All right, I'll just wait one more minute, and then I think we'll call it a day. And of course, don't forget this in space, you know, ISRO and NASA, of course, they should be working together, AI, research, technology. These things are areas where these two countries have incredible potential. And I, will, I suspect there will be a lot of collaborations. Ayurveda, that's exciting, you know. Um, I'm all for a yoga regulation uh, re regulating body somewhere because I think this yoga industry has kind of gone out of hand but the COVID has been good because nobody's doing yoga you know? all the studios got shut down and I hope they remain shut down because they are totally messing up yoga uh, Ayurveda hasn't come yet but I think we need to make sure we have protect the IP and all that good stuff how do you see India's global position post corona it's India's for the taking. You know, it, I think India alone can elevate itself and uh, stand up and put its hands up because I, I think that nobody is going to give you anything. Nobody gives anybody anything. At some point, you have to just step up and say, I'm a world leader, you know, which it is. I think we're too humble. We don't gloat where the rest of the world, they have little to show for anything, but they do gloat, right? So this is where we've gone wrong. I think... We need to, I think we really need to be very uh, kind of vocal about our uh, what we can do for the world. Uh, 
yes i uh, i don't know this question what exactly you're referring to but i did another amazing um uh, interview with um uh another uh, on another um, pr pragnya bharati right it's an amazing channel i'll put a link to that video too so you can see uh, with giri darji so you can see um that interview too it's a bit similar but a little bit different too yes this question is interesting how about us declaring india into th that whole religious freedom oh my god so uh, very disappointing firstly the good news is it's not legally binding it's not some it's these are people just make reports right it's like some kind of recommendation they have lists and these lists change i don't think we've been on the list ever before so the next time i'm sure we won't be it's shameful considering how many atrocities and persecution there is in the world and we actually are more tolerant and open than anyone and yet we get put on the list but it shows who's funding these organizations it shows who's on the board it's all you know it's all the the nexuses of hate i would say so either you ignore them or you have to put up some lobby group or pr i mean i think the government can have some statements too like kind of really just rubbishing this report because it's stupid you know i think people will, will not uh, they'll 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 ignore it because honestly the public sentiment is very positive about india it's just this mainstream western media and academia that wants to create these lies about india that doesn't exist do you believe in the rapture that's near um i don't know exactly what that term is uh, so it's predicted by the evangelicals i don't know what that is is that the the coming of the end or something like that or some sort of apex for mass conversion i don't quite know what that is i have to do some research but um i think it's early days i think there's a lot more to happen and i'm a big believer in believer in karma i think this planet has interesting karma to go through we are burning through some karma now i think india has very interesting karma i think it is the the leader in so many ways and i think it needs to step up and until it does i don't think the world the world story ends you know the advice that i want to give to young people is great question thank you um be proud of your civilization it's the oldest civilization in the world and it's the most relevant and the most moral and the one that has given the world the most be proud of sanatana dharma it's the only way forward for humanity you are so blessed and honored to have reincarnated into this incredible um faith uh, or or just this um kind of amazing fold and be proud of it uh, no matter what anybody says uh, it's they don't they don't understand you or they're jealous or what not but uh, just know in your heart that you're on the right path you're very blessed that you even have access to this knowledge i mean around the world people are dying to find out the truth and if they're lucky they will come to india or they will find an indian guru and 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 find find their meaning of life we are born into this lineage already it's within us you know it's in our dna it's with it's in the fiber of uh society here so we must honor it cherish it i think protect dharma no matter what protect it with your life and uh, be proud be stand up tall uh, be vocal i think speak out write about it be you know don't let anybody say anything and stand up to these these foo foo liberandos you know cut them down you know you have facts on your side so uh, but do that but be proud of who you are and i think aspire to do something for your country because this country is great because of indians right not because of the government not because of the leadership most definitely not right they have only failed us so um you've made the country great we've all made it great so we must continue to do that so i think i will i will it's a great uh point to end on so i will uh leave it here thank you so much i am so honored to spend this time with you It was so nice to almost a hundred people came. That's a lot. So um, do.
do reach out you know my email address and add me uh, subscribe on my youtube channel uh, connect with me on social media i want to hear from you and um, i will uh, look uh, look forward to connecting with all of you and I'll do this once again I'm sure I, um, Shivam will arrange something and invite me over for another topic another time so I just want to uh, you know it's daylight here it's morning now uh, the sun is up it's a new day but um, I'm going to go back to bed get some beauty sleep so it was amazing to connect with all of you and check out my acting modeling work as well. I have a million pictures. Just go to Google Images and type in Preeti Upala. You'll see everything. Um, one good question. As a citizen of any country, what is our responsibility? Uh, it is to uphold the dharma of that country, to uphold the ethos and be the dharma, be an embodiment of that, right? And look, India is an incredible country and Indians are amazing people. And everybody uh, needs to know that. And they will only know that when they come in contact with you. So just be the best, be your best self and be the dharma in the world. Uh, Sanatana dharma is actually more relevant than ever. I think this COVID has shown that. And uh, in the coming weeks and months, we'll actually realize how relevant it is, I think. So I'm certainly going to be playing my part because I'm going to be writing and speaking a lot on it. So uh, I'll keep you posted on that too, on other future interviews. But thank you so much. I leave you. Have a beautiful day. Good night and uh, namaste. Thank you.